Now, this is a special day at the bridge. We're in the, 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 the deeper part of summer now. We're starting to wind down a little bit, but we've got youth camp coming up this week. It's going to be a big deal. We've got a lot of kids going to youth camp. And we, we're so blessed today to have a guest speaker with us who has been with us on one other occasion. His name is Paul Reed. Uh, he talks English, but it's weird English. I just got to warn you, okay? He's from Manchester in the UK. He is campus pastor at one of the audacious church campuses. He was here, what, three or four years ago, shared a great message, really challenged our hearts. He's a great young man. He's going to be actually speaking at the youth camps this week. But, but he, he is a great, great communicator. We're so honored he's here today. Would you put your hands together and honor with me Paul Reed? Well, good morning, everyone. Why don't we thank the worship team? Hey, Laura, you good? Well, let me just start by saying this is how the Queen speaks English. I mean, not when she's on the TV because she kind of goes a little bit more posh. But like, this is how she speaks when she's just chilling at the palace watching Netflix, I guess. I don't know. She's watching, what's the royal family show? The Crown. She's watching The Crown on Netflix going, no, no, yes, no, no, no. Well, let me just uh, continue by saying a huge thank you to your incredible pastors for three things. Number one, for having us with you today. That is a massive privilege for us to be in the sunshine, if I'm being honest, like literally just that is enough. But um, to be able to come and be a part of a service or two today is, is a huge privilege. And uh, I want to say thank you for that. Secondly, because you hosted my son for three months, which, you know, is more than most people can manage. So I just want to say thank you that you looked after him and you, um, you inputted into his life so beautifully for those three months. And the third thing is to say thank you to you for those two individuals right there, Corey and Amber. Legends! We love, we love your next-gen pastors so much, and uh, we're trying to get them to visit us in England. They're going to come, I believe. All right, so I want to speak to you today a message that is called, You Were Born to Discover. You Were Born to discover. When I was a kid, one of the things I liked to do was play hide and, you guys call it hide and go seek, right? In England, we just, we just lose the go. We're just like hide and seek because we're efficient with the English language. And I have two brothers, right? So when we were kids and, you know, we were, I was born in 1976. And so therefore, my childhood did not involve consoles or anything like that, my younger childhood involved free entertainment. Give me a wave, anyone who remembers games for free. There you go. There you go. No money required. You know, I think you call it tag, things like that. Those, those were the games we played, all right? Hide and seek, completely free of charge. And my parents would be like, okay, go and play hide and seek. Now, I was a master at hide and seek. I could hide so well. I remember one time removing my shoes and putting them uh, behind some drawn curtains so just the toes were sticking out. You trying to decide whether to be impressed by that, it's not getting a lot better, so just, just applaud that. Okay, oh yeah, so I would, I, would, I would leave my shoes and then I would hide somewhere else. So then my brother would come along and he would see my shoes and he'd go, ha ha, and I wouldn't be there, just some green mist. It's coming out of my stinky shoes. One time I took it to a whole other level and I recorded on a cassette player. Give me a wave, anyone remember? People of a certain age, other people be like, what is that? I recorded on a cassette player the sound of my breath. <laughs> like Darth Vader style breathing into a battery operated, not, not one that you plugged in, but a battery operated cassette player, hid it in the airing cupboard, which is like the laundry cupboard in our house. So my brother would walk past and hear, 
And he would be like, yeah, I've got you. And he would open the door and of course I was not there. If they gave out Olympic medals for gold, for, for gold, for hide and seek, I would win gold for sure. But I now, as a grown up, I have three children. And you gotta understand that when you play hide and go seek as a, as a child, you kind of play it differently to as you would play as an adult with a child. So the idea of hide and go seek when you are a kid is to hide, not to be found. But when you play as an adult with your kid, depending on how much they're getting on your nerves, you hide to be found, right? This is Willow here, my daughter. Um, just sat down here, there she is, and she's older now, but when she was younger, we used to play hide and seek, and I would hide in a way that was so obvious. I'll be like, okay, ready, steady, go. Because I wasn't really trying to hide, I was trying to be discovered. It was like hiding with purpose in mind. And, you know, maybe if they'd been, you know, a little bit, challenging I would hide for real and I'd be in the in the wardrobe just with my iPad just chilling for like hours on end but in the in the majority I would hide to be found two different types of hiding right hiding to not be found but hiding to be found and I think if there was anything that sort of represented the heart of God in a way that I want you to understand this morning is that, is that God has hidden for you so much stuff because you were born to discover it. He's not hiding things or hiding himself from you because he's mean. He's hiding things for you because he loves you. Let me read a Bible verse and then I'll go a little bit further and then I'm going to give you just a few things to help us um, move from survival to discovery. I'll come and explain that in a minute. Proverbs 25 in the Old Testament, this book of ancient wisdom that stands the test of time and is able to speak to us in 2022 says this in verse two, Proverbs 25 verse two. It says, it is God's privilege to conceal things. In other words, hide things. And it is the king's privilege. Now you have to understand that's a small K, not capital K, King Jesus, but small K, the kings of earth, me and you. It is the king's privilege to discover them. So God's job and his privilege is to conceal or hide things, not from us, but for us. And how he created us was that we would enjoy the privilege of discovering all that he has for our lives. The problem is, is that life happens. You were born for discovery, but over time you become a survivor. You see, things don't always work out how you hoped they would work out. You get disappointed. You get hurt or offended. Things don't go what you, in the way that you expected. And over time, you, you make a shift from living in the way that you were born to live, which was to discover all that God has for you. That idea of waking up in the morning full of faith, saying, God, I don't know what today holds, but I'm excited. I'm ready to go. We, we go from that to a survival mentality when you wake up in the morning and you say, God, get me through today. That's all I'm asking. I don't want anything new. I don't want anything different. If I can just get through today, if I can just get through my, my work day, if I can just get to the end of the week without killing my husband, like that's all I'm asking. If I could just do the school holidays without murdering my children, like that is... A, a little bit too honest there. I love my children. I've never murdered any of them. They're in full health. <laughs> but can you see the two different mentalities? 
One is in the heart of God for you and one you potentially drift into over time. No one chooses it. Nobody says, I'm going to be in survival mode in my marriage. I'm going to be in survival mode with my finances. I'm going to be in survival mode with my work. No, no, we don't choose it. It just sort of, sort of creeps up on us. And we can get to a certain age or stage of life and we've been just surviving for so long that the idea of discovery, of new, of increase, of faith, of momentum, of moving forward is just like too much for me. And we can have churches and and, and homes full of people who were born for discovery but are living as survivors. And I need you to know this morning, I came all the way from England and I'm hoping that I'm speaking slow enough and clear enough for you to understand my accent without a translator. But if you understand one thing, and I'm going to say this as plain as I can, you were born for discovery. You were born to discover. People say things like, oh, I'm a born survivor. No, you're not. You became one. And I appreciate that because stuff happens. And God is not making light of any of the stuff that's happened in your life through this message. I'm not trying to minimize or belittle or make light of the stuff you've gone through. I'm just saying there's more in your life than that. Your life did not start or end with anything you've been through. The Bible says since before the foundation of the earth, God knew you. So what's happened to you and about you is not the thing that defines you. Is Jesus the King of Kings? So, how do we get out of survival mode? How do we know we're in survival mode? If this kind of thing creeps up on us and you kind of don't really realize it's happening, I feel like there should be some signs or some signature things that help us recognize oh, I I was born for discovery, but I'm actually living in survival mode in this area of my life. And I would suggest, and I don't mean to be offensive by saying this, because I, I, I'm, I include myself, I would say that in every single one of our lives, in at least one area, it's possible that you've fallen into survival mode. Maybe not everything. So how do you get out? Well, here's the simple truth, is that you have to make a choice. You didn't choose your way into it, but you can choose your way out of it. I'm going to show you three, maybe four, depending on the clock, things that are choices that you can make that will force you and your family out of survival mode where, let's be honest, the enemy, the Bible describes the devil as the enemy of our soul. He wants you in survival mode. He wants you when someone speaks about increase or the future. He wants your heart to sink. He wants you to roll your eyes with cynicism when someone says something about the future that's positive and full of faith. He wants you to be in survival mode. But God created you. Let me say it again. You were born to discover. So let me go through the the few things. Here's the first choice that you can make to guarantee you will run at the speed of light 187 Thousand, eight, t- eight, eight, one point twenty one gigawatts. <laughs> Here's the first choice: you have to choose to be inspired, not intimidated. Those two words seem really different, but they're actually two sides of the same coin. Survival mentality means that when you find yourself in a certain situation. You will always move towards being intimidated, whereas a discoverer in the same situation can make a choice, especially when those feelings of intimidation start to come up that says, you know what, I was born to discover. I don't know how I'm going to work this out. This seems bigger than me. This seems scary. I I, I don't know quite how to deal with this person, but I choose to turn those feelings of intimidation into inspiration everybody can pull someone down but a discoverer says you know what I'm going to lift up let me give you an example 1 Samuel 17 um, 
you know that David, shepherd boy David, man after God's own heart, David, that guy, you know David kills a giant in 1 Samuel 17. It's a Sunday school classic. You know it, you've read it to your kids and all of that. You know the story. But what happens in 1 Samuel 18, after this has happened, they're all returning back to the the city with King Saul, because David who killed Goliath, he wasn't king at that time. He was just a shepherd boy. He was just a cheese delivery. He was an Uber Eats delivery driver. Okay, that's all he was. And yet the Bible says he killed Goliath. But listen to what happened because Saul, who was the king, it seems as though he had slipped into survival mode even after a great victory. Because look what happened. It says, when the men were returning home, this is 1 Samuel 18, verse 6. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet, not David, they were meeting King Saul with singing and dancing and joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres and they danced and they sang. Here's the song. Saul has slain his thousands. Probably true. Saul was a big guy. He was a warring king. He was a soldier. He probably had slain thousands. But the second verse of this tune that was blasting out from Spotify that day was the, 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 was the, the verse that really upset King Saul. And it brought the survivor out in him because they said, Saul has slain his thousands. Saul's like, yeah, too right. I have. You've been reading my, my, uh, my Instagram stories. And then it says, and David, his tens of thousands. Not true. How many had David killed? One. I mean, he was a big dude, so we could say it counts as two. But even two versus thousands, there's still a clear winner here. If we're going to compare, which Saul is obviously doing, because survival mode forces you to compare yourself with other people, right? And so Saul was very angry, the Bible says. This refrain displeased him greatly. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? You might as well give him the throne now, says Saul. He's he's been a full-on big baby at this moment. And from that time on, the Bible says, Saul kept a close eye on David. Let's be honest, Saul should have and definitely could have grabbed David by the arm, stuck it in the air and marched him into town going, check out my guy David. We don't even need our soldiers to be our enemy. We just send our shepherds. Like the Philistines, oh, it's only the Philistines. We're going to send the preschoolers out. They're just going to deal with it. Like we don't, I didn't I mean, I didn't even get off my throne. I didn't even need, I didn't even break a sweat because this guy, even our shepherds are stronger and harder and more fierce than your most fiercest warriors. Our shepherds, that's what he should have done. He should have been inspired by David and used David's story to lift the faith of the room and lift the, in, in, inspire the whole nation. Imagine other shepherds going, I I thought all there was to me was just being a shepherd. I didn't know I could do something great for God. Imagine people in other trades that didn't quite get in the army. They they were rejected for some reason. They thought their life was just that they 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 were just a woodworker. And yet Saul goes, check out my boy David. He's a shepherd and he killed a giant. Imagine all the low level workers going, I think I could kill a giant. Do you think, do you? Can you kill a giant? You could definitely kill a giant. Uh, you, uh, yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but this is what Saul did. He was like, well, if I make him look good, that makes me look bad. That is the definition of survival mode. 
And I don't know what situations in your life are intimidating. And I'm not saying, as I said before, that this is no big deal and you shouldn't, you, and it's definitely not a guilt trip. I'm not trying to say you've done wrong by doing this. I'm trying to help us recognize. I believe that God is trying to help us recognize that the situations in our life that intimidate us, what we can do, because we were born to discover, we were made this way. If you don't believe me, just check out a baby. Everything to a baby is like new and exciting. If, you, if you've had kids, just raise your hand if you had kids. Do you remember when your baby first discovered their toes? They'd gone for weeks and then all of a sudden they were like, what is that? Yes, in my mouth. It's like every sound and smell and like, it's just new. Because that's what you were born for. So remember that guy. Remember that toe-sucking little girl. Next time your boss at work comes and says, I want you to take care of this project. And the survivor in you says, no, run for the hills. Remember that little baby girl and say, all right, my toes are in my mouth. I am going to do this. Next time the enemy comes along and says, you know what, your marriage is, is pretty much over. You guys have not been getting along for, so, for such a long time. Instead of going, yeah, you know what, I may as well run for the hills now. I may as well quit now. Save the pain. You need to dig deep and say, I'm not a survivor. I'm a discoverer. And I think all I've seen so far is all there is. But I know there is something different in my marriage that God has for us. So therefore, I will not quit. I will not run. This is what I was born for. There's your choice. Next time you're intimidated and the last thing you want to do is run towards the giant. All you want to do is about turn and run. Do a David. Do a David and run towards that thing. With, with the Holy Spirit's help, you say, God, I'm, a, I'm born to discover. That's choice number one. Choice number two is to make sure that you see opportunity, not hard work. Survival mode brings out the lazy bones in us. Because the thing about survival mode is that it kills vision. Because surviving is the vision. All you got is enough faith to believe you can get through what you're currently going through. So if someone comes and talks about vision, pastor comes up on the stage and says, hey, we're going to do this, or we're going to start this ministry, or we're going to grow, the church is growing, we're going to launch this service, and we're going to do that. The survivor in you will say, are you joking? Do you know how much I already volunteer in this place? I'm the first here and the last to leave, most Sundays. That's a survivor in you. Let me give you an example, Numbers chapter 13. You, you'll know the story of the children of Israel have been promised something great by God. Increase, the promised land. And so they send out 12 spies to go and get it. Two of them were discoverers, 10 of them were survivors. Listen to the different reports. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community in the desert and they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit, the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went to the land that you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. It's pretty good. Here's the fruit, verse 28. But the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, all the enemies and all the people with all of their strength. Then Caleb silenced the people and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we certainly can do it. He wasn't saying, no, those, those enemies weren't there. The cities aren't fortified. He just said, yeah, I know, yeah, I know there's cities. Yeah, I know there's enemies. Well, they weren't just going to roll over and give it to us. We should definitely go and take hold of it. That's the language of a discoverer. But the men who, gave, who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they explored and said, the land we 
explored, devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw Nephilim there, these giants, and we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. There's the language of a survivor. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. How did they know that? Did a little trust pilot survey. (laughs) Dearest enemy, if you were going to compare us to an insect, would you go A, grasshopper, B, locust? How did they know? They didn't know. They just saw themselves as grasshoppers and assumed, and the reality is how you see yourself means how you behave, which means ultimately it's how people see you anyway. But a discoverer says, this may be hard work. This, this may be more from me, but what an opportunity. Caleb's like, gosh, I don't know how we're going to do this, but there's something on the inside that's telling me that we can and we should. If you're going to get out of survival mode, you need to say, God, help me see opportunity. Where everyone else sees hard work. Thomas Edison, the guy that invited, in, invited? In, invented the light bulb, he said, most people miss opportunity because it comes disguised in overalls and looks like hard work. Reportedly, hundreds of failed attempts at designing a light bulb. And then, eventually... After exploring every way not to do it, instead of interpreting that as his own failure, he was like, I'm becoming more of an expert on light bulbs with every failed attempt. I now know 249 ways to not make a light bulb, which means that this next attempt could be the 250th correct way to make a light bulb. The definition of an expert is someone who's got it wrong so many times that there's only the right way left to do it. You're looking at the expert going, wow, I don't think I could ever do that. They are looking at themselves going, I couldn't do this. I've just tried everything else and the only thing left to do is the right way. You just got to keep trying. Don't see hard work. Know that it will be hard work, but see it as an opportunity. That's how you get out of survival mode. The third thing is this, and this will be my last one before the team come and join me and we're going to respond to God. If you want to get out of survival mode, you've got to choose character, not compromise. Character, not compromise. There are some unbelievable examples of this in the Bible. Something about survival mode means that you start to compromise on things that you said and thought and believed you would never compromise on. Did you ever say, like Peter, I will never deny you Jesus? You think Peter was, like, didn't mean it when he said that? Of course he meant it. He's not a liar. He wasn't like, uh, I'll definitely deny Jesus, but I'm just going to say that I won't. No, Peter meant it with all of his heart. He said, I will never deny you, Jesus. It was the point where Jesus was washing people's feet. Remember that scene in the New Testament? He's washing people's feet. Peter's like, oh, no, he's like trying to be like fake humble. He's like, oh, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. And then Jesus says, oh, well... If, you, if I can't wash your feet, then you, you, know, you can't be part of what I'm doing. So then he's like, all right, wash me all over. <laughs> he's like crossing his arm, taking his t-shirt off. Jesus is like, chill, Peter, just, I just want to wash your feet, mate. Calm down. And in that exchange, Peter's like trying to prove something. He says, I will never deny you, Jesus. He's around the table. Jesus is there in the flesh. All his mates are there. They've just had their feet washed. It's looking awesome. They're having a great time. I will never deny you, Jesus. And he meant it. But Jesus gets arrested, everybody scatters, Peter goes into survival mode. The Bible describes a scene where Peter's alone by a fire. Get the comparison. He was with his mates around a table. Now he's alone by a fire. And people start going, oh, you know Jesus, don't you? And he's like, no. It's out of his mouth before he even knows he said it. Someone else says, yeah, 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 you sound like one of those guys from Galilee. You, you, you definitely know Jesus. No, I don't. Starts getting angry, starts swearing at people. Then a little girl, a little girl says, yeah, yeah, you know Jesus. He's like trying to, you know, 
You ever see a parent lose it with their kid and you're like, oh, you've lost it, mate? They're like, the voice is cracked. They've like, oh gosh. Okay, let everybody, let's just, nothing to see here. This is that moment. Peter's now swearing at children. It's like, no, I don't know Jesus. Who did this little girl's like? <laughs> Peter's like, and then the Bible says that the, the cock crows, the signal that Jesus reminded him, told him about happens, and all of a sudden it's like, Pfft. she's gone into survival mode, that's all. And there's things that you say you would never do. There's habits you have now that five years ago, you would have said, not me, I'm not doing that. I'm not going there. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to talk like that. And yet survival mode makes you look at something that you previously thought was even disgusting. And then go, well, you know what? Let me give you another example in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 6, 25 says this, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. Now, if you're not familiar with your Old Testament measurements, I'll forgive you for not knowing what a quarter of a cab of seed pods is, but I think we all know what a donkey's head is. A siege is a military strategy where they camp around the city. It's not, it's not aggressive. They just cut off the supplies. And slowly but surely, the city slides into survival mode. Imagine before the siege, somebody comes up, Corey and Amber come to you pre-siege, and they say, oh, do you want to come to our house for dinner? You're like, yeah, I'd love to. And they say, great, we're having... Uh, Donkey's head. You'd be like, ugh, what do you mean? I don't want to eat a donkey's head. No way, I would never eat that. A few weeks later, the siege is happening. No food coming in, no, no waste going out. Everybody's skinny, everybody's hungry. People then start looking, hey, you still got one of those uh, donkey's heads in the freezer? Corey's like, yeah, that's all we got left. You're like, all right, let's get some mayo on there. Let's just, I don't know, some salt and pepper. I mean, before it was disgusting. Now I'm in survival mode and I can justify eating a donkey's head. How many times do we do that? I'll never do that. I'll never do that. But then something happens in our life. We end up in survival mode and we're literally, metaphorically eating donkey's head saying, well, yeah, I mean, Obviously, I wouldn't normally do it. It's only because of blah, blah, blah. Like, I would never normally say that. I didn't mean it. I was just angry. No, no, no. I was just tired. And so, therefore, I... Survival mode. You were born for discovery, not survival. So, what do we do? Well, we've got three choices. We need to choose to be inspired. We need to choose to see opportunity and not hard work. And we need to choose character over compromise every time. Even if you're starving, even if a donkey's head starts to look tasty. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Do you wanna to go to a party? No, not when I just get back from youth camp. I don't go to parties. I don't go in environments like that. Six months later though, Things are tough and you're under pressure and you broke up with your girlfriend or, and it's like, yeah, I suppose a party's not bad. I mean, I'm not going to do anything. I'm, I'm just going to go. Got to be a light. Got to share my faith. Find yourself at a party where six months ago you would never have gone. Well, let me show you the difference between Peter in uh, Luke chapter 22 where he denies Jesus and Peter in Acts chapter 2 when he preaches and 3,000 people decide they're going to reorientate their whole life and live for God there's two things that happen between Luke 22 and Acts 2 
And those two things are the two things that you need to make sure you stay out of survival mode and you live waking every day with a discoverer's mentality. Firstly, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had not, was not here in Luke 22. I mean, they had Jesus in the flesh. But what I'm saying is, the difference between Luke 22 and Acts chapter 2, one of them is the Holy Spirit. And you have, the best way I've ever been able to explain the Holy Spirit to my children or the young people in our church is that it's the power of God for every day. You have the power of God for every day. It's not just for church. It's not just for an altar call where we, you know, cry and just sort of respond. No, no. The Holy Spirit is the power of God for every day and you have it. And so Peter, the Bible says, stood up and spoke with such authority. That's what you have. With the Holy Spirit in here, you can speak with authority over your marriage. You can speak with authority over your job. You can speak with authority over your children while they sleep. You can speak with authority over their future when they're making choices that don't line up with how you brought them up. You can speak with authority because you, like Peter, have the Holy Spirit. The difference between Peter, Luke 22, and Acts uh, Acts 2 is the Holy Spirit. The difference between you, BC, before Christ, and IC, in Christ, is the Holy Spirit, the power of God for every day. The second thing, I can see that clock, even without my glasses. The second thing, the difference between Peter in Luke 22 and Acts 2 is the Holy Spirit. The second thing is with friends. Holy Spirit and holy friends. You got those? Because the Bible says that Peter stood with the 11. The Bible specifically lists that he was with the 11 and it specifically describes that he was alone by the fire alone by the fire survival mode stood with the 11 discovery mode you need the Holy Spirit and you need to look around this room even in the chairs that represent people that aren't here but you know they will you know they come they're just not here today and you say thank God for the Holy Spirit and these holy friends because without them, I'm going to live just surviving day after day and that's not what I was born for. Imagine a huge boat in a wild storm. Waves crashing, rain lashing down and wind and just like chaos. Where's the survivor? He's in the middle of the boat, hugging the mast. Praying, God, get me out of here. And I wonder how many times you've prayed that. God, just get me out of this job. God, just get me out of this marriage. Just get me out of this church. No, of course not. Same storm, same conditions. Where's the discoverer? Right at the front of the boat, foot planted, foot planted, screaming at the same wind and waves that the survivor is saying, get me out of, going, is that all you've got? Who discovers new territory? Not this guy. It's this guy. Is that all you've got? I can see something on the horizon that I would not be able to see in this position but stood here, as scary as it is, and the fact that I may drown, I can see something, and I'm going for that. Discovery. So come on, all around the room, would you stand to your feet? And I wonder, do we have a singer as well? I'm not disqualifying you, mate. I'm sure you're a great singer. I just don't know. I just don't, oh, there you are. Turns out you're not a great singer. It's this guy. <laughs> He's the MD. That mic is just for the band. Don't worry about it. 
You know the breathe song that we sang? Is, is that this that I can hear? Why don't we sing this worship song together? And while we do it, or before we do it, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Sorry, I'm, I'm racing ahead of myself. I wanna pray for you. And when I've prayed, I say amen and we go into the song. And during that song, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you exactly the areas of your life where you have slipped into survival mode. For some of you, it's really obvious. You know exactly what it is right now. Holy Spirit speaking to you. You're like, it's that, it's that. I know it's that. Other people, God's going to show you right now. In fact, let's do that now and then I'll pray after that. Come on, let's sing. You are God, the God of all creation. The earth grows and longs to be with you. And where we are, our hearts are raised to heaven. Because we breathe to worship you. You are God. The God of all creation The earth grows And longs to be with you Where we are Our hearts are raised to heaven And we breathe to worship you Come on, we sing Cause you are God The God of all thing to do in church is to listen to the word of God and then go home I don't know about you Pastor Gary but in our church I don't know I want to go to church and go home transformed That's what, what, otherwise what's the point there are better clubs than the church if, if it's just about hanging out but we're here for transformation. So with every eye closed and every head bowed, if you know, as we were singing that, there's an area of your life where you have slipped into survival mode. I'm going to hand back to Pastor Zach in just literally a moment. I know the clock's gone and so I'll be quick. But if you know you have slipped into survival mode and right now you're praying, God, help me to get out. I want to discover all that you have for me in every area of my life. I don't want there to be a corner where I'm sweeping things under the carpet, where I'm living in a way less than I, I could be and should be. If that's you and you know there's an area, I'm not going to ask you what it is. I just literally am going to pray for you and then I'm going to hand back to Pastor Zach. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand now. Put it up nice and high. Good job. So many people responding to the word of God. Keep it up. Keep it up. I want to pray for you. You know, by doing this, what you're saying is to me, include me in the prayer, but, but, but to, to heaven and hell, who both await the outcome of this service, by the way, not because I'm all that, but because you are. Heaven and hell are literally holding their breath and heaven is cheering because you're saying, I was born to discover. Father, for every single person who's raising their hand and responding to you in this moment, I pray 
that by your Holy Spirit and with amazing holy friends, you would cause there to be a shift on the inside. God, I pray for words of authority to be in their mouths. I pray for courage from heaven to be in their hearts. I pray for resilience from you in their soul so that every situation that you have put them in, they would firstly recognize your authority in their life, your authorship of their life, and then they would walk with confidence. They would walk with a quiet confidence that says, I was born to discover. I pray for anyone who feels like they're drowning right now, that they will walk out of this place with your Holy Spirit like a, like a life vest around them, keeping them not just afloat, but actually taking them to a place of standing on solid ground, able to see differently, able to think differently, able to act differently. I prophesy that people in this room in these next few weeks will have people come to them and say, how do you... Like, how are you so strong? How are you so happy? How do things go well for you? And you will be able to say, it's because I was born to discover. The King of Kings made me for a life of discovery. And I'm just figuring it out as I go. God, I pray for each person in the amazing authority of the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Did they hit home with everybody this morning? Can you identify with that? Hey, can we thank Pastor Paul Reed for that message this morning? How great was that? Amen. While you're still standing for just one moment, I want to say this very quickly. Maybe during our time of prayer and response, maybe in your heart, you just said, you know what? I've never received Christ into my life. Maybe you made that decision this morning or you wanted to do that. We want to give you instructions on how you can take your next steps of faith. As soon as this service is over today, maybe you want someone to pray with you, agree with you, or encourage you. That's why we have prayer teams that are available after our service, okay? So come see one of our prayer teams. They're going to be right down here toward the front of the platform after the service. not going to embarrass you. They're just here to connect with you and encourage you. Not only that, but if you made a decision to follow Christ, we want to give you a free book. It's a little gift called The Next Seven Days to help you get started in your walk with God. If you have any questions about that, our prayer teams are here to help you, to pray with you, and to encourage you. We're so glad that you made that decision. Can we put our hands together and welcome people into God's family this morning who made that decision as well? Awesome. Hey, go ahead and be seated. We're going to conclude here in just a couple of moments. Just a couple more quick things that we want to do. This has been such a strong service this morning. And just to see people responding to that message and to that word is awesome. We're so excited about what God has in store for you today and the next few days ahead. But in this moment, we just want to take some time to honor God by bringing our tithes and our offerings into the house. And just thanking God for his faithfulness by bringing our treasure into the house. You know, there's a few different ways on the screen that you can give right now if you'd like to do that today. There are digital options on the screen. You can choose whatever is most convenient for you. If you'd like to give an in-person physical gift, you can do that today as well. There are envelopes there on the seat backs. Just grab one of those and choose whichever way is most convenient. You can drop them there at the giving stations. Before you exit the auditorium, there's one on either side of this first set of exit doors. And there's also one outside near the kids' first time check-in area. But thank you so much for your giving and for your faithfulness. You know, Pastor Paul Reed's gonna be speaking at youth camp this week and we are really excited. We're sending the biggest group of teenagers we've ever sent before to youth camp. And I wanna say a couple of things about that. There are a whole lot of students that were able to go to youth camp this week because of your generosity. So thank you so very much for your gener generosity. That was above your tithes. That was additional offerings that you gave to make that happen. And you know what? You might not see the, the tangible return on that, that investment in the next few days or even the next few mo moments or months. Can I tell you this, though? You're making an eternal impact, an internal investment when you made that decision to invest in those students. But thank you for sowing into the house of God. Together, we are able to do things that we could not do on our own. And as we always say, it's because of a faithful God and faithful people. So thank you so much for that. Hey, two things this morning before we go. Again, youth camp is happening this week, so as a result, we will not be having Bridge Youth this Wednesday night. Listen, I don't know what your daily prayer time looks like, but pray for 
our teenagers. Pray for our 6th through 12th graders going to be going up to Bridge Youth Summer Camp this week. It's going to be great. And I know that God is going to do great things because my life was tremendously impacted by going to the very same camp that our students are going to this week when I was growing up. So pray for them as you do that. And again, no Bridge Youth this Wednesday night. And then finally, next Sunday is one of our favorite things. Water baptisms are happening next Sunday morning. They're happening after our 1130 service. If you still want to sign up to be water baptized, if you recently made a decision to follow Christ, if you've never been water baptized before, or if you, like me, say, hey, you know what? I did that when I was really, really young, and I want to do it again. I want to reaffirm as an adult my obedience to following Christ and water baptism. We would love for you to be a part of that. You can go to our website, thebridgechurch.tv, or you can go to the Bridge app and just click on the baptism banner. We'll get you all the details. Again, it's happening after the 1130 service next week. It's going to be an awesome Sunday. Hey, we hope that you've enjoyed being in church today. We hope you have an awesome day, a great week. We love you. Pray for our Bridge Youth students, and we will see you in the house next Sunday morning. God bless you.